Welcome to Emergency Chaos, where we provide tips and tricks to make you a better ER nurse. Today, we are going over the medications used in rapid sequence intubation, including succinylcholine, rocuronium, etomidate, ketamine, propofol, and Verset. And if you want to learn which is used when and why, stick around. So now let's get right into the medications, right? The one key principle is that you should always administer the sedative prior to the paralytic. Imagine just being awake, but unable to move or take a breath. So you sedate the patient at first, then you administer the paralytic afterwards, right? And you will usually just push them back to back, but you push the sedative, the sedative in first, the sedative in first, right? I should say that sometimes rare uh, times, because of the times of onset, there may be times when you push the paralytic first and then quickly after push the sedative. But for the most part, 99.9% .9 of times, just remember the sedative before the paralytic. So the most common, the most common sedatives that we use or induction agents are going to be etomidate, ketamine, propofol, and versed. While the most common paralytic agents that we use are sucks and rock. And yet, yeah, Pretty much no one says the whole name out. You just say sucks or rocks. So keep that in mind. So let's start off with etomidate. It's by far the most used sedative simply because it's hemodynamically stable, meaning it won't affect blood pressure as much or it doesn't affect the vital signs as much as the other agents available. So it tends to get used the most because a lot of the times when someone is getting intubated, it's because they're sick and they're unstable. It doesn't, so etominate doesn't affect pain. So keep in mind that you may be also administering like fentanyl for pain in patients with increased intracranial pressure so that you prevent worsening ICP from the stress and discomfort of being intubated. So the typical dose of etominate is 0 0.3 milligrams per kilogram with an onset of about 30 seconds and a duration of up to 10 minutes. As far as adverse effects, I've definitely seen this and it's just myoclonus, which is just jerking like movements that kind of mimic a seizure. But when I saw it, it wasn't with RSI, it was with uh, when we were cardioverting someone. So with, with RSI, you give a paralytic right afterwards, so the patient can't move either way. So even if the patient was going to get myoclonus, you just give the paralytic so you probably won't see it, right? But it is a complication that's uh, not a complication, but a side effect that's possible uh, with using etomidate. So, because it, etomidate is hemodynamically stable, when is it going to be used? It's going to be used in patients who are unstable, for example, with a soft blood pressure or patients with head injuries, as it does not lower the blood pressure or increase the blood pressure because they can be they can both be damaging to neuro patients. Since if you lower the blood pressure. In a neural patient, you can cause ischemia. And if you increase the blood pressure, you can cause worsening of ICP, right? So etominate is also useful in unstable seizure patients and patients with heart disease, as again, it does not increase or does not decrease or increase the blood pressure. And it's also useful in shock. It's even useful in respiratory patients because it's just a good backup. It doesn't have any bronchodilatory effects like other agents we're going to discuss. But again, it's just an overall safe medication because it doesn't affect vital signs as these other agents. Now, let's talk about ketamine. It's a use, it's very useful in respiratory issues and it does have bronchodilatory properties. And it's useful as well as in shock because it increases the heart rate and the blood pressure. Another good thing about ketamine is that it does have analgesic properties. However, because it can increase the blood pressure and the heart rate, it's not used for cardiac or neuro patients since that can be damaging as we've discussed, right? With an increase in heart rate or, de uh, in our heart rate or blood pressure, I mean. The typical dose is 1.5 milligram per kilogram with an onset of approximately 60 seconds and a duration of up to 20 minutes. As discussed, it's useful in respiratory issues and in shock. However, it's not useful in patients with cardiac or neurological conditions. Another use because patients maintain their respiratory drive with ketamine is that it can be used for awake intubations. And we're going to discuss what an awake intubation is later on. So just keep uh, watching the video for that one. So again, ketamine 
uh, is really useful for respiratory issues because it has bronchodilatory properties and the patients maintain their own respiratory drive while they are sedated with ketamine. And then let's go on to the next medication. We have propofol and Versed. So thinking back, we pretty much don't use propofol and Versed for intubations. Um, probe we use a lot for conscious sedations. Um, and both probe and Versed are often used or use as sedation for patients who are intubated, right? So after they get intubated, these two medications will be used as sedation. However, they are rarely used, but they can still be chosen. So that's why I wanted to talk about them here. Propofol dosing would be 1.5 milligrams per kilogram with an onset of approximately 40 seconds and a duration of up to 10 minutes. The main side effect that is it can have cardiovascular depression. In other words, as we've talked in other videos, it can cause hypotension. It's a potent anticonvulsant, which is why it may be chosen for stable seizure patients. But if the patient is unstable, it's not going to be picked again because it lowers the blood pressure. Then there's Versed, which is, is an, also an anticonvulsant. Ooh, battery's running low. Uh, Versed, which is also an anticonvulsant. Um, and that's why it may be chosen, but it also does have those hypotensive effects, right? Um, the typical dose for Versed is 0.2 milligrams per kilogram and an onset of 60 seconds and a duration of up to 30 minutes. Propofol or Versed, uh, again, will definitely be used for post-intubation uh, sedation for the patient. All right, now let's get into some paralytics. Sucks is essentially old faithful, pretty much loved because compared to other paralytics, it's quick on and quick off which as we've discussed before, the longer a patient is paralyzed, the likelier complications are to occur, especially if something goes wrong and the intubation attempt is unsuccessful. However, it's not used when there is a risk of hyperkalemia and as it can cause hyperkalemia itself, itself in susceptible patients. So it's not gonna be used in renal patients and patients who are found down with an unknown downtime as those patients are prone to getting rhabdomyolysis, also, not used in burn patients or crush injuring patients, again, related to being wary of hyperkalemia. Another important and key reason not to use sucks is patients with a history or familial history of malignant hyperthermia, as it can cause it. So be wary of malignant hyperthermia because it can be deadly. It's also not used in patients who we pretty much know nothing about, because what if they have renal problems? which it being the ER, that can that tends to happen a lot, right? We get patients we know nothing about. So it's still all faithful because it's quick on and quick off. Again, because the longer a patient is paralyzed, the likelier it is for complications. The dosing is 1.5 milligrams per kilogram. The onset, is, the onset is approximately 45 seconds with a duration of 10 minutes. And then just to summarize, not used in patients who may be at risk for hyperkalemia. Now let's get into rock. It's pretty much used when sucks is contraindicated because it doesn't have any crazy side effects. You might be thinking, so why isn't rock just used instead all of the time? Well, because it takes longer to work with an onset of around 60 seconds and it lasts forever, up to one hour. And again, as we've discussed, the longer the patient is paralyzed, the likelier complications can just turn bad. For example, rock is given and the intubation attempt is unsuccessful and the patient starts deshiding and now the blood pressure is crappy. Sometimes just trying to bag the patient, but it's not working and the patient ends up getting the cricothyrotomy or worse, the patient arrests. Well, of course, that's like the worst possible complication, but it's I'm just trying to il illustrate a point that longer someone is paralyzed, the worse the outcomes can turn out. But it's still definitely used at times. And again, the dosing is going to be one milligram per kilogram onset of 60 seconds and in duration of around 60 minutes. And again, it's going to be used when sucks is contraindicated. But because it does last long, you just got to make sure that you have all your backup equipment and supplies ready just in case the intubation is unsuccessful. But because you watch this video and you're a good ear nurse, you're going to have all the necessary equipment ready beforehand just in case anything goes wrong. By the way, if you're finding this helpful, I created a book and a course to help you save time and energy with mastering the chaos of the ER. They're meant to take you from a novice to proficient, ensuring you learn a solid foundation that you can build on. The book 
comes with all emergency fundamentals that you need as a new ER nurse. The course takes it further with video lessons, practice questions, real scenarios, charting essentials, and overall practical tips to help you feel confident and prepared. You'll find the links in the pinned comment and description below. And as always, teamwork makes the dream work. And here at Emergency Chaos, we are proactive, not reactive.